Have you ever had the grandstanding debate of whether a hot dog is a sandwich? Spoiler alert, it's not. Well, let me ask you another question. Is a Snuggie a blanket or a sweatshirt? There's the Snuggie. Now, this may seem like a silly question, but you should really think twice about your answer. Why? Well, you see, that question has not only been debated, but even answered in front of the court. The court of international trade, that is. Why? Well, how a product is classified can mean either big savings or big costs for the company that sells it. Which is why the question of whether this thing is a sweatshirt or a blanket is actually really high stakes. If you've ever rocked a pair of Chuck Taylors, you may have noticed their soft, fuzzy bottoms and sides. For Nike, who bought um, Converse, the issue was, you know, is it a shoe or is it a slipper? And they clearly want it to be considered a slipper. And so Nike is adding felt, a soft bottom or soft sides around the outer sole in order to say that this should fit in the category of, of a slipper rather than a shoe. So a shoe is a slipper, an action figure is a toy, an Apple Watch is a telecommunications device, and a Snuggie is a, we'll get to that one later. The reason companies care so much about their products' classifications is because of tariffs. Tariffs are the taxes countries place on imported goods. But all products aren't assigned the same tariff amount. See, tariffs change depending on where a product is made. So a t-shirt made in, say, Mexico has a different tariff rate than if it were made in China. Where it gets interesting is that small changes to an item's design or material can actually move the product to a different tax code with a lower tariff. So manufacturers can tweak their product specifically for the purpose of lower tariffs. It's called tariff engineering and it's been around for centuries. Back in 1881, sugar was a luxury product and its tariff was determined by its type. The Dutch standard determined value solely by color. The darker unrefined the sugar, the lower the tariff, and vice versa. Since color was the only standard to determine the tax, one clever importer decided to add molasses to his highly refined sugar to see if it could pass as cheaper, darker sugar. But the Port of New York caught on to his antics. So they chemically tested his product, realized they were right, and charged the importers with a higher tax. This began a legal dispute that eventually made its way all the way up to the Supreme Court. Now the court ruled in favor of the importer. Why? Well, they said that even though port authorities found a way to chemically test the product, the only viable test at that time was color. So that crafty importer successfully engineered a lower tariff. About 30 years later, another case was litigated, this time about a different luxury, pearls. In the 1900s, imported jewelry, like necklaces for example, had a crazy high duty rate of 60%. But if pearls were imported in their natural state, not set or strung, they were only taxed at 10. So one man decided to test his luck. The story is that uh, while in Europe, the man saw a necklace that he wanted to purchase for his wife and bring into the US. It said that he took off the pearls and took the string out. Then he placed those unstrung pearls with drilled holes in them into a bag and sent them into the United States. Customs automatically flagged it down and the two parties ended up in court. And the ruling? They're either strong or they're not strong. If they're not strong, 10% duty, that's it. Tariff engineering remains a common practice even today. You may be thinking, how? Well, remember our question? Is a Snuggie a blanket or a sweatshirt? That was only debated four years ago. In 2017, the Court of International Trade argued that because you can wear a Snuggie, it should be classified as a garment, which means a tax of almost 15%. But Snuggie's parent company, All Star Marketing Group, argued against that classification, defining the product as a blanket, hoping to keep its tariff at a mere 8.5%. Customs lost the case after the court ruled that despite the Snuggie's sleeves and pockets, it's not apparel. So why do certain items have lower tariff amounts than others? Well, it's kind of complicated. There is always a why, and it is often lost in history. Um, sometimes these things continue on forever and people have forgotten, but it's, it, it almost always originates with a domestic industry that was perceived to be um, in need of protection. 
Over the last 50 years, textile manufacturing moved mostly outside of the U.S. So for the companies that stayed, tariffs continue to provide some economic protection. Some tariffs relate back to historical events, like the U.S. having a dispute with another country and slapping on a tax that remains in place today. So how do we access tariff rates? Is there a glossary of some sort? Great question, and yes. It's called the Harmonized System and used by customs worldwide. In America, we use the Harmonized Tariff Schedule of the U.S. This tariff schedule is basically an index that lists all goods numerically along with which category it fits in. The HS or Harmonized System lists six-digit codes for the assigned good. But countries can add longer codes for a more specific classification. So in the U.S., for example, goods are assigned 10 digits. And the littlest detail, like where it's from or what it's made out of, can change the product's code and thus the tax rate. Men's shirts, women's shirts, men's shirts with collars, men's shirts of cotton, men's shirts of polyester. It's incredibly detailed. And speaking of shirts, one well-known brand that spoke openly about how they practice tariff engineering is Columbia Sportswear. Columbia executives discussed their strategy in a podcast interview with Marketplace.org. I have a whole team of people that uh, work with, together with the designers and developers and merchandisers and with customs, actually, to ensure that while during the design process that we're considering the impact of tariffs. Tariffs for women's shirts that are made out of man-made fiber and include a pocket below the waist are classified for a lower cost than those without. So with that knowledge in mind, Columbia designers created a small pocket, or what they like to call a chapstick pocket, on their PFG Tamiami shirt. That pocket makes a big impact, dropping the tariff rate from almost 27% to just 16. And those savings have a ripple effect. They don't have to pass that higher cost on to consumers and so that they don't lose market share and um, so that they don't lose sales. Um, and don't have to lay off workers. While tariff engineering is a legal practice, there's a few things to remember of what you can do and what you can't. You can't lie about what the product is, right? No one can make false statements to the federal government. The merchandise has to actually be presented to customs in a way where it can be inspected and, and seen. So no artifice or disguise is the, is the legal term. Where you are crossing the line into sort of illegal behavior to make a false declaration about uh, the product itself or what it's what it is when it crosses the border. So with companies able to engineer, how should consumers feel? Well, it depends on who you ask. According to Mary Lovely, if a manufacturer has successfully engineered a product from abroad, it means lower costs when it hits the shelves. From an economic point of view, we want people to make choices based on the prices that actually reflect the true cost to society, but also that, that give them the most satisfaction. I just consider this to be day-to-day -day good management of your supply chain. The same way an accountant says, I don't know why you're paying taxes on that, you could just do this. So where are we now? You may remember that in 2018, the Trump administration raised tariffs on certain items like aluminum, steel, and of course, China. The Biden administration has so far kept most of those tariffs in place. And our experts say higher tariffs could invite more engineering. And with the rise of technology in product development, it also raises questions. Like what might happen if you make a product out of a 3D printer that's located in Silicon Valley, but uses software that was developed and downloaded elsewhere? We may be in for more cases, like sugar, pearls, and of course, this blanket. We want to hear from you. What do you think the future will look like? Write below in the comments and like and subscribe for more.